It's, it's been a blessing and a privilege to, uh, to get to share in this week with you. Uh, it really is and has been um, a delight and a joy for me these last uh, seven years to get to come back and be part uh, of a place that God used so powerfully in my life uh, to really change the whole direction of my life. So uh, thank you for letting me have the privilege of, uh, of being part of this week with you and sharing in life with you in God's Word and Frisbee um, and lots of good things. And um, I'm thankful for that. As we wrap up our thoughts on, on words this morning, I just want to kind of go back to where we started and just reminding ourselves of the great power and the great influence that our words have. Death and life. The power of life and death lie in your tongue. The most influential instrument that you have is, is not the instrument that you play, but the instrument that lies in your mouth, in your tongue. Your words have great power and great influence. And as we've looked this week, we realized that this incredibly powerful thing that we have is something that sometimes is really, really hard to control. And I don't know about you, but sometimes the more I become aware of it, the more I realize just how hard it is to control and just how easy it is for things to come out of our mouth that don't honor God or don't represent who He is or what we really think we should say. And it reminds us that apart from the transforming power of Christ, of the gospel being at work in us through the Holy Spirit who lives in us, that we can't. Right? We can't do it ourselves. But what we can't control, what God can what? transform. All right, what we can't control, God can transform. And because of the power of God living in us as his children, we have the potential to talk differently. We have the ability, the potential to talk differently because of God's power. And not only do we have the potential, but it's something that God expects. If you're God's child, if you're one of his kids, if you've been called into his kingdom through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then, then not only do you have the potential to talk differently, but God expects it. And he tells us that if our faith, if our, if our belief in him and our worship of him is not transforming our lives and our speech, then our faith is really futile. Look in James chapter 1, verse 26, and I'm going to look at a few verses this morning, but let's start here. James chapter 1, verse 26, James says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Now, that word there for religious, it means to fear or to worship God. So it kind of gives us a little bit more of an understanding uh, about what's going on there. You know, when we think about religious, we might say, well, I, I don't, I'm not religious. I have a relationship with Christ. And, and, and we get that. We believe that, right? It's not about being religious. It's about knowing Christ and having a living, abiding, personal relationship with him through faith. So this word here that, that James uses is not talking about religion as an institution. It's talking about fearing or worshiping God. So what does that mean? What does it mean to fear God? It, it means to stand in, in awe of who He is. It means to see Him for who He is and to see yourself in light of who He is and to stand in awe, to be captured, to realize that He is holy and perfect and beautiful, majestic and mighty. And, and so it's to see Him for who He is and then it's to respond accordingly, to respond with worship. And so to fear God, to worship God, is to give Him the glory and honor and reverence, to give Him praise. It's why you were created. And the gospel reunites us with our purpose, right? We were made in the image of God. We were made with the capacity to, to know God and reflect His glory, right? Sin marred that image. It separated us from our purpose. But God, through the gospel, through Jesus Christ, is restoring not only life to us, but He's restoring purpose to us. He's restoring for us the ability to live for why we were created, which is to glorify the Creator. And one of the ways that God wants us to do that is through our words. And so He says, those who consider themselves religious and yet don't keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And He says, your religion is worship. Your, fa your, your worship basically is a failure. You're not getting it. Religion is worthless. You're all, your wonder. He says you're not getting it. If it's not changing the way you talk, if your walk with God, if your relationship with Him is not affecting your speech, then James says your faith is futile. And so how do we move from a futile faith to a faith that influences and controls our words? Well, 
I want us to uh, look at a few things in Ephesians this morning. We're going to spend most of the rest of our time there. Let's start in Ephesians 4.29. Uh, because here's, here's where I, I want to emphasize this morning is, is certainly we want God to transform our tongues so that we're not saying the things that we shouldn't say. And, and Paul's going to deal with that in this verse. But God wants us to go beyond that. And so let's look at what he says. Ephesians 4.29, Paul says, as he writes to the church in Ephesus, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. All right, we've been talking about the fact that life and death are in the power of our tongue. That we have the ability to speak life, but we also have the ability to speak death. There's great power in your tongue. And so Paul addresses that and he says, don't, he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, that word literally means rotten. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever bit into something expecting it to taste good, and found out that it was rotten. Have you ever, have you ever been there? Like maybe you just had a container of fruit or something like that, and you, you, ate, you were eating some, and it was just great, and all of a sudden you, you put one in, and it wasn't so great, all right? You've been there, right? It's not a pleasant experience, is it? Right? We, we all can identify with that because we've all been there, and we all know what that feels like, and that's literally the word there that, that, that Paul is using. He says, don't let any rotten talk come out of your mouth. Right, don't let words that are rotten come out of your mouth. Something that's gone bad, unwholesome. Uh, the, I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says, don't use foul or abusive language. It says, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're someone who, who knows Jesus and you've been brought into his kingdom, his love and grace is, is filling your heart and your life, he says, then let that affect the way that you talk. So don't use foul language. Words that are ugly and rotten. He says, don't use abusive language, language that's hurtful, mean, demeaning. God wants to deal with that aspect of our mouth. And again, we've talked about it. It has to be the Holy Spirit's influence in our life, right? So God wants to transform that area of our life, but he doesn't want us to just clean up our mouth. Or have us watch our mouths. The goal isn't just that we wouldn't say bad things, right? The goal isn't just that we wouldn't tell a lie. The goal isn't that we wouldn't just not gossip. But God has something greater, something more that he wants us to consider. So let's look at the second half of that verse. He says, let everything you say be good and helpful. So that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear him. Let's go back and, and uh, read it again. This is the ESV. He says, only speak what is helpful for building others up according to their what? Needs. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So that it may benefit those who listen. Think about this. Every day, you and I encounter people, right? whether it's our family, whether it's people in school, whether we're out and about somewhere, every day we encounter people. And every day, those people that we encounter, we have an opportunity to interact with them. Every day, we have an opportunity to either speak life or to speak death. And Paul here is challenging us. He says, see people for the way God sees them. You know, so many times in life, it's just so easy to get tunnel vision. It's so easy to get consumed with ourselves, right? It's so easy to get focused on ourselves, our lives, our wants, our wishes, our problems. But God wants us to step back and realize that the people around us are often hurting, right? The people around us are often going through difficult times. The people around us are often really, really needing some of God's encouragement and God's love. And we can become instruments that God uses to help others with our words. And so I want to I challenge you to, to seek to see people the way God sees them. Because every day we have an opportunity to bless somebody with our words. Did you know that you have life and death in the power of your tongue? You have the opportunity to speak blessing to people. right? Whether, whether it's a word of encouragement. Maybe you could just say, God help me to have my eyes open for someone in my life. Maybe it's just, and practice this today. That somebody that needs encouragement. 
You know, we can bless people with encouragement. Sometimes it's a congratulations. Hey, you did a great job. I, I, God really worked through your life, and I just want to let you know I noticed it, and, and it was a blessing to me, so I speak a word of congratulations. It, it could be a comforting word. When you realize there's somebody that's hurting and, and you speak words of comfort. It could be uh, a, a word of challenge, right? Sometimes we, we challenge each other. Sometimes it's a word of hope. And sometimes, even in the right context, it could be a word of rebuke, right? To someone that we know well, somebody that we love and care about, speaking truth and love to them might be a rebuke. Every day we have the invitation to join God on his mission. Right? That's one of the cool things about the gospel. Is not only is it a call to live in and for the kingdom of God, but it's a call to live in and for and on mission with God. And God is on a mission of bringing life. Like his, his, his heart and his desire is that men and women would come to know him and experience his forgiveness, his redemption, and that they would live in a relationship with him and they would move from death into life. The Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but what? All should come to repentance. And we can join God on his mission of life. Right? By speaking words of life. By sharing the kindness and love that we've encountered in Christ. By sharing the gospel. Right? By sharing the good news that they too, even though they are sinners like us, can experience the mercy and the grace and the kindness and the love and the goodness of God, even though they don't deserve it because Jesus died for them and he rose from the dead on their behalf and he invites them into his kingdom. So we need to see people the way God sees them. Every day, we have the invitation to join God in his mission of bringing life. And we can do that through our words. You can do that through your words. To share the kindness and the love that you've encountered in Christ. And just to remind us about that kindness, Ephesians 4.32. Paul says, be kind and compassionate, what? One to one another, forgiving each other. How? How? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. You see, when we think about this mission that God's given us of speaking life and hope to people who don't deserve it, just like we didn't deserve God's grace, he says, never forget what God did for you. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other in the same measure that, that in Christ, God forgave you. Right? Think about the forgiveness that God offers you, complete, total, right? Complete forgiveness, past, present, and future. God's already paid for your sins through the death of his son on the cross. And he's willing to forgive you, to, to declare you righteous, to count Christ's sacrifice on your behalf. He says, don't forget that. Don't forget what Christ has done for you. Because we need to be consumed daily with that reminder that we were people who were separated from God and apart from His grace and His mercy and apart from His compassion and His kindness, apart from the fact that He chose to reach out to us in His love and His grace and to bring us into His family and to bring us into a relationship with Himself, that we were lost. He says, don't forget what you've been forgiven. Don't forget what Christ has done to you. That's what's going to enable you to be kind and compassionate to each other. When you realize what Christ has done and when you're consumed with his incredible love for you, even though you don't deserve it, it will help you see people differently and it will help you speak to people differently. Right? Because you'll remember, even though maybe they've done something hurtful to you, maybe they don't seem to deserve a kind word or an encouraging word, but you realize neither did I deserve God's love, neither did I deserve his grace, neither did I deserve his kindness, yet he chose to give it to me freely anyway. And so we can join God on his mission. When grace fills our hearts, when we're consumed with his love, it will flow from our lips. When I'm consumed with the fact that God has dealt graciously, graciously with me, it will change the way that I talk. And we can use our mouth not for evil but for good, to speak life instead of death. And so how do we do that? How do we, how, do we, how do we do that on a consistent basis? Yes, we need to remember what Christ has done, but remembering isn't enough. So Ephesians 5, and we're going to wrap up here with a few verses. Ephesians 5, 15. Paul says, so be careful how you live. Not as fools, but as those who are wise. Now, now we can just stop right there. How many of you would say, I would rather be wise than be a fool? All right. All right. It's better to be wise. We could all agree it's better to be wise than to be a fool. And so Paul says, he says, be careful. Think about how you live. Pay attention to how you live. Don't be a fool. 
right? He says, but be wise. Then he tells us how to be wise. He says, make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. All right. Paul says, in these evil days that we live in, these days were evil nearly 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote, they're still evil today. Sin is present. Satan is at work. But he says, in the midst of that, in the midst of the evil that happens, he says, we have the opportunity to live differently and we have the opportunity to live for what matters. So he says, make the most. Make every opportunity count for doing good. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly. So if you want to avoid being foolish and you want to be wise, he says you have to think, to use your brain that God gave you. And he says, don't be thoughtless, but try, seek to understand what the Lord wants you to do. He says, seek out. He says, every day you've been invited to live for something that matters, to join God on his mission of bringing life, of speaking life, of bringing hope and encouragement. And so he says, we need to join God on his mission. How do we do that? Verse 18. Really, really great illustration. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. All right, pretty simple instructions. He says, he says, don't be drunk with wine, but instead let the Holy Spirit fill you and control you. And really here, he's given us the secret of how we can experience God's transforming power in our life and ultimately in our words. And he uses this really great illustration. He says, just as alcohol changes who you are, Right? When you become intoxicated, you don't act the same way, you don't talk the same way, you don't walk the same way, you don't think the same way, you don't act the same way, you don't treat people the same way. Are you with me? Right? It's, it's a really great illustration. This is when you're under the influence of alcohol, you are not who you normally are. And you talk differently, you act differently, you think differently, you live differently, you treat people differently. And he says, in the same way, he says, don't do that. He says, don't, don't give control of your life to wine. But he says, instead, let the Holy Spirit fill you and control you. He says, live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Live under God's influence. Let the Holy Spirit influence you. So listen, so that you don't talk the way that you used to talk, so that you don't live the way that you used to live, so that you don't treat people the way you used to treat people, but you'll live differently, transformed, not by trying harder, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the secret to talking differently, to speaking life instead of death. It's living under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. So just as alcohol affects the way someone lives, he says in the same way as followers of Christ, we're to allow the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So that means we have to submit to him and surrender our lives to him and ask him to fill our life. We need to spend time in his word, to spend time in prayer, to spend time in worship, right? So that we can allow the Holy Spirit to consume and fill our lives so that he can direct our lives. Because here's the thing, what we can't control, God can transform. And God wants to use you Every day, where he's placed you, here, now, when you go home, in your family, in school, in your church, right? God wants to use you right where you are to be his agent of speaking life. And that's my heart for each and every one of you. You know, as I shared a little bit earlier this week, one of the things that I became deeply convicted about as a camper here was the way that I talked to people, the way I talked about people. And I... I knew it wasn't in a way that honored God. I wasn't representing his kingdom. And God began to transform that through my time here. And I want God to do for you what he did for me. And I want him to transform the way that you speak so that he can use you to make a great difference. Listen, never underestimate the power of your words. I mean, you may think, I'm not very influential, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not very important, I'm not very big in the, the grand scheme of things, but listen, your words have the power of life and death, and you never, ever know the influence and the impact they'll make. Uh, just a few years ago, as I was sort of going through some things, uh, I found, uh, it was several years ago now, I found a little New Testament um, and it was a New Testament that my pastor had given to me back in the 19, I hate to say this, 80s. Um, yes, I was alive then. And, and he had been to Israel, and he had came back, and he brought me a little Bible, and, and he had given it to me. And he wrote a little note in it. And I, and I believe I was somewhere around seven years old, seven or eight. And he just said, you know, I, I, I just want you to know I'm proud of you. And I believe God has a special plan for your life. Something like that. It was a few more words. Right? Those words were written 
30 years ago. I still have it. And, and, and they still encourage me. And just a quick note. Just a few words. But they still have influence and power and encouragement in my life today. And so just think about how powerful your words are. You have tremendous opportunity every day to make a huge difference. And I want to see God at work. And in my life and in your life, I want to see the transforming power of Christ at work so that we can speak life to those that we encounter every day. Every day, you encounter people who need life, who need encouragement, who need hope, who need comfort, who need challenge. And you and I, under the influence of the Spirit of God, can be those people who bring that life challenge, live close to Jesus, right? We can't control our mouth. We can't transform our life, but we don't have to, right? Isn't that the great thing? We don't have to. God will do that if we will draw near to him, if we will surrender and submit our lives to him. He will transform the way that we talk. He will transform that. He will use us. All we need to do is draw close to him. So live close to Jesus and then speak life to someone today. It's my challenge for you today. Speak life. Ask God to show you someone, maybe very specifically. I hope you'll do it to more than one person. But ask God today, God, make me sensitive and aware to somebody. Maybe it's one of our, our fellow campers. Maybe it's your, it's your faculty member. Maybe it's your counselor. Maybe it's the, someone working in the cafeteria who works on the cleaning staff here. And just ask God to make you aware of them. And ask God to give you a word of life for them. And then, I want you to do that today, but I want you to seek to do that every day. What would happen if you woke up every day and just said, God, help me to, just to one person today to speak life. Let me be your instrument today to speak life. Take control of my mouth. On Sunday, uh, there are going to be about 100 more campers, approximately, give or take, yeah. uh, invading <coughs> our space. All right. Now, some of them are your friends, right? And you're excited about seeing them. But, but a lot of them you've never met. How, how, do you know how many new campers we have coming this session? I do not. Okay. But a significant amount? Yes. No, a significant number. A significant number. Thank you. He, he keeps me in check. That's from my heart. <laughs> Thank you. A significant number. Not amount. Uh, but you knew what I meant though, right? All right. See, they knew what I meant. A significant number of students are coming. This is going to be their very first experience at Chehi. And one of the reasons that, that you were brought here this week was to be instructed deeply in your music and have a chance to uh, enjoy music with your peers and have some focused uh, instruction. But you were also brought here so that you can be leaders, so that you can be influencers when all the other campers arrive. And I want to challenge you to be aware of, of opportunities to speak life to them. Certainly, you're going to see your friends and you're excited about seeing them. And I was online and, and uh, you know, they're, they're, everyone's excited. People are posting. They can't wait to get here. They're jealous that we're here already. Um, but there's a lot of campers that are coming for the first time. It's going to be their very first experience with this camp. Seek them out and speak life to them. Make their first impression of what Chehi is what it is, which is a place where God's love is freely shared with each other and where we encourage and love and care about each other and use your words to communicate that. You have no idea where they're coming from. You have no idea what's going on in their life. But I can promise you this, in the hundred that are coming, there are people that are hurting. There are people that have problems going on at home. There are people that, are, that, that need God's encouragement and hope in life. And you get to be part of sharing that. So that's my challenge for you. To seek out to do that here. And then as you go home, and I know no one wants to think about that, and, but eventually this will end and we'll have to go back to real life. The bubble will burst and real life will resume. Eric's in pain. Um, it's still painful even now as an adult. But when you go home, seek to be that instrument of transformation. Seek to speak life. That's my prayer for you. Would you bow your heads? And uh, with no one looking around this morning, how many of you would just say, um, I truly desire in my heart to be an instrument that God can use to speak life and hope and encouragement and healing 
to people that I encounter today and every day. How, just raise your hand and say, I want to commit to that. Would you pray for me? Thank you so much. I want to pray for, for all of us this morning. Father, we come before you this morning. Father, I'm grateful for this week that you've given us together. Father, it has been a good week. And Father, we look forward to today and, and the conclusion of this week. But Father, we thank you. Uh, for the privilege that we've just had to be together this week, to, uh, to share meals together, to share laughter together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given to share music together, to learn and grow uh, and to glorify you together through music. Father, I thank you for the times that we've had to, to uh, play together and laugh together and enjoy life together. I thank you for the times that we've had to open your word together and, and let it speak to our hearts and to our lives. Father, it's been a good week and we, we give you thanks. Uh, we give you praise, and we thank you for your great blessing in our life. And, uh, but Father, we pray this morning that you would fill our hearts with your spirit, that we would desire to live close to you. And Father, I pray that our desire to live close to you would be born out of an understanding of how great your love is for us, how great your affection is for us, that you were willing to give up your son, to allow him to suffer and die on our behalf. Father, I thank you that you raised him from the dead. I thank you that he is our living Savior. And I pray that we would draw near to you through Christ. Father, out of a heart of love. And Father, I pray that you'd fill our lives daily with your spirit. That we would seek to live under your influence. And Father, I pray that you would empower our tongues to speak life. To speak hope. To speak encouragement. Father, use our tongue, what could be an instrument of evil, what by nature is untamable, what by nature is destructive. God, may your transforming power work in so mightily that your power and glory is seen. Father, that ultimately the transforming of our tongue would lead to you being glorified in our lives and in this world. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.